In today's Gospel reading, one of the things that our Lord is emphasizing is that a prophet is not welcome in his own hometown. A prophet is not accepted in his own hometown. Basically, what our Lord was saying is that he himself, the greatest prophet, God himself, is not accepted in his own hometown. And why is it that they refuse to accept our Lord? Is it not true that they heard about the great and mighty works that he had been doing in Capernaum and in other places? Notice also when our Lord talks about the prophet Elijah and the prophet Elisha, he says that, you know, these prophets were not sent to the people, but rather Elijah was sent to a widow in Zarephath in Sidon, and Elisha was, was sent to Naaman the Syrian. And he and Naaman was cured of his leprosy, and no one else was. And basically, these are foreigners. So what our Lord is saying is that the true prophets, such as Elijah and Elisha, were not accepted by the people. They couldn't do any mighty works for their people, but these foreigners did accept them, and were they received miracles from these prophets. So in other words, they had to believe in the prophets. The people should have believed in the prophets, but they did not. And in like manner, they should have, should have believed in our Lord. But as we know, many did not, and many to, to this very day do not. Now, when our Lord goes to the, to the synagogue in his hometown, and he unrolls the scroll, and he reads from the prophet Isaiah, and he says, today in your hearing this this has been fulfilled. So basically what he's saying is that this prophecy of Isaiah is applied to himself. It's fulfilled in himself. So listen to the message. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. To bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So the time of the Lord's favor. So this is the favorable time because the kingdom of God is at hand. We can grasp it. We can attain it. This is the time. And it's not just a recovery of physical sight, but spiritual sight. In other words, we are blinded by our own sins. We are blinded by ignorance. So Christ came to give us true sight, to reveal the truth to us. But as I mentioned, he's rejected. So why is it that the people of his own hometown reject him? Could be a number of reasons. But the real reason, I think, is that they grew up with him. Or our Lord grew up in their town. They knew our Lord. They knew what he was like. And before our Lord begins his public ministry, he probably led a very secluded life. He was probably very quiet, didn't make any show of his knowledge or his intelligence or his wisdom. So they thought, well, he's just a simple carpenter. They didn't think much of him. And then all of a sudden he starts talking with great wisdom, and now nah, they're not going to believe him. And here's the other thing. Jesus grows up in this small town. He didn't go to Jerusalem and study under certain Pharisees. In other words, he wasn't trained in the ways of the faith. And so these, these people are thinking, well, okay, he's no more intelligent than we are. He hasn't studied more than we have. He's not like one of those people like St. Paul, for example, who went and studied under Gamaliel or, or whatever Pharisee it was. In other words, he's not educated in the ways of faith. So who does he think he is telling us about the things of God? things about religion. And so they reject him. In other words, they're thinking according to human terms. So as our Lord points out, a prophet is not accepted in his own hometown. Now, a prophet, it's not because he has an education. Yes, St. Paul had an education. But recall that the apostles, most of the apostles were simple fishermen. They didn't have an education. Some of them may have had some education. But most of them did not. So when a prophet proclaims the truth, it's that prophecy is from God, or the, the revelation is from God. So when our Lord says this, he's not just referring to himself. He's referring to every person that will make the effort to proclaim the truths of our faith. 
In other words, every prophet that is going to proclaim, proclaim the message of salvation will not be accepted by their own hometown, or the people they grew up with, or the people of their own family. It's kind of a reality. It's a sad reality. And they will use similar reasons. Oh, well, we know you're a sinner. Who are you to tell us? You're just a hypocrite. So people won't listen to this. But the reality is that each one of us are called to be prophets of God. In fact, through our baptism, we participate in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly powers of Christ. So each and every one of us is called to proclaim the good news to everyone around us. But the problem is that it's not only people in our families or people that may have known us as we were growing up who don't accept us as prophets. The real problem is we don't accept ourselves as prophets of God, as agents of God to bring the faith to others. And we make the same kinds of excuses. Well, I'm a sinner. I commit sins. I didn't have an education like Father Stephen did. I didn't study in the seminary for seven years. I don't know my faith. I don't know my scripture very well. I didn't study the Bible. And therefore, if you believe that you cannot be a prophet of God, you won't be a prophet of God. But our Lord is telling us we are called to be prophets of God. Now, today's first reading is very significant in regards to this. You know, here's St. Paul, yes, he studied under Gamaliel, yes, he was very well educated. He was a city boy, basically. But he says that he did not come to proclaim the mystery of God in lofty words or wisdom. He's not making a show of his intelligence. In fact, he goes, he goes on to say, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that you might have, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. In other words, he's saying he didn't use lofty words or wisdom or persuasive arguments. I mean, to a certain extent, in Mina, but in another place he mentions that he's not a good public speaker. He wasn't a good speaker. He was probably someone who's very introverted, very shy, not a good public speaker. His letters are amazing, yes. People like that tend to write good letters. But he was not a good public speaker. But he went nevertheless, and he proclaimed the truth, and he focused on the crucifixion of Christ. Why do we focus on the crucifixion of Christ? Because that kind of summarizes our faith. Well, God became man, took our sins upon himself, died on the cross for us so that we can have our sins forgiven, so that we don't end up in hell, so that he could open the gates of heaven, so that we can make it to heaven. This is God's plan for us. If we want this, we just have to follow Jesus, obey his commandments, study the Bible, the New Testament, and practice our faith. That's it. Are you telling me you can't? Repeat that? You can't convey that message to someone? Of course we can. This is what St. Paul did. So when he went to places, he preached Christ crucified. He also preached the resurrection, yes. But what I mentioned just now is it's kind of the summary of our faith, the very basics of our faith. And we are all capable of proclaiming it to those around us. St. Paul says that unless people hear the word of God, they will not believe in it. No one is sent to proclaim the word of God. They will not hear it. Therefore, they will not believe. So you and I, we are the ones who are sent. God has a purpose for each and every one of us, not just to enable us to make, to make it to heaven, but to use us as instruments of his goodness in this world. And the greatest good that we can do is to try to bring a soul uh, to Christ, to salvation. Today we celebrate the Feast of St. Aidan, who is the patron saint of this church, hence the white vestments, hence the Gloria. So for us, because he's the patron of this church, it's a very great feast. So we have the Gloria to, to honor God, to give glory to God, that he has given us someone like St. Aidan to be an example to us. Now he, was, he started off as an Irish monk, and they were missionaries that were sent to northern England. So from that community of Irish monks that St. Aidan belonged to, some monks had gone and 
their efforts to evangelize were a failure. And they came back and they said, oh, these English, they're just too hard in it, we can't convert them. St. Aidan spoke up and said, well, brother, maybe you were a little bit harsh, maybe you were too rigorous, we need to practice compassion and charity. So it was decided to send another group of monks to Northern Ireland, and so St. Aidan was one of those who was sent. And he was so successful in converting people, he was made a bishop. Now, as a bishop, especially nowadays, he tend to be very busy, but at that time, St. Aidan worked as a missionary. So he went from place to place. But he didn't ride a horse. He wasn't drawn in a carriage. He went on foot from place to place. And as he traveled on the road, wherever he saw people, he would stop and he would speak to them. If there was a house, he would go in and he would speak to them. If he saw people walking on the road, he would stop and he would speak to them. In other words, he made the effort to convey the message of Christ to every single soul that he encountered on his journeys. And because of his efforts and his fellow monks, Christianity was established in Northern England. And he became a very great saint. So, because of his efforts, he became a great saint. But he was also noted for his, his generous generosity towards the poor. So he himself had nothing. He was a monk, monk's take vows of poverty. So whatever gifts he received from the from the wealthy, they would often often give him gifts. He would just distribute it to the poor. So because of his goodness, because of his kindness, because of his love, but also because of his efforts to evangelize the people of Northern England converted. So the, the conversion of Northern, Northern England is kind of attributed to St. Aidan, primarily to St. Aidan, his example and his influence on his fellow monks. So yes, St. Aidan had a good education, but the key about St. Aidan was his humility and his love for every human being. In other words, St. Aidan also didn't make a show of his wisdom and his knowledge. He spoke to the people in language that they would understand. Everyone he encountered, or most of the people he encountered, were poor, uneducated peasants. But yet, through his efforts, the faith spread. So are we uneducated? Are we poor? Are we incapable? Do we think that we lack talents? Are we shy like St. Paul? Good. Because then we are forced to trust more in God, in the Holy Spirit working through us. So we have nothing to fear. We have God with us. We have the mandate from God. Go out, proclaim the good news. This is the message at the end of every Mass. Go and proclaim the gospel of the Lord. You are sent out in, in peace. So we receive the things of God when we come to Mass. We are nourished by the Eucharist. God is, is within us. We are nourished by the Word. Hopefully we're nourished by, by the homily that the priest gives us. And we are sent out into the world to share the good things that we have received. Are we going to keep them all to ourselves? No, we need to be like St. Aidan. Whatever riches we have received, let us share it with the poor. Let us share it with those who are spiritually poor, who are spiritually starving for the truth. Let us make the effort and let us leave the rest to God. Thanks,